I'm here today with Tally Berman. She is an autism specialist and an author. And um, I'm so grateful, Tally, that you agreed to be part of this um, uh, this summit. And uh, I would love uh, love for you to tell us all about what you do and how you can help parents and children um, connect. Because I think what you're doing is pretty different than uh, what most people do um, in terms of therapy and response to autism. I'm very happy and honored to be here. And um, yeah, I think what we'll talk about a little bit later on, but I, something I feel really passionate about is obviously the connection between a parent and a child, but, but specifically about the child's experience. You know, I think there's oftentimes such a focus, um, and understandably so, on behaviors, on acquiring skills, you know, skill acquisition, mm -hmm. also a lot of biomedical components and healing-specific mm -hmm. issues, gut issues, all very important things. But sometimes what gets lost in the shuffle of all that is, like, the person yeah. <laughs> behind those checklists and um, that regimen. And so mm -hmm. I, um, I really want to make a stand for being a voice for the, yeah. the people who are being treated and to help people with autism and for us to work with people with autism and relate to people with autism in a way that will be very empowering for them and really prioritize their own experience, having a positive sense of self, a sense of belonging. So yeah. Yeah. that's a primary and, focus on what I do. Yeah. And you know, um, your book, Play to Grow, um, you know, I discovered it when I was doing my training at the Sunrise Program. Um, and for those that don't know what the Sunrise program is, it's S-O-N, Sunrise. Um, it's a very, very different approach um, to therapy with children. And it really uh, focuses on um, letting the child lead the way, but also, um, you know, just accepting, going in there with no expectations and accepting that whatever the child is doing, they're doing it for a reason and that, and then, um, you know, it's our job to just kind of go in there and accept them and join them. And um, when they're open and available, then we can start, you know, kind of putting our agenda in there. Um, but it's really a, a beautiful, um, humane way to interact with this population. And Play to Grow was just such a um, great book um, for different types of activities and games um, for for my son. So I'm so I'm so thrilled that you wrote that book. It's been I'm so glad. Um, valuable. So, I'm yeah, so, so glad. yeah, so tell me, tell me more, Tally, about, um, well, how did you come to this um, way of being with these kids? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. And you mentioned the Sunrise Program, which is where my formal training was done. Just to, to, be, to be clear, since in the last couple of years, I've actually become independent of the Sunrise Program. Uh -huh. I no longer teach as a Sunrise Program teacher because I wanted to bring my unique voice to what I teach. Sure. I wanted to incorporate the breadth of knowledge they have learned along the way and all the telesummits I've run over the past couple of years. I've had sure. a great honor of, of, you know, picking the brains of Temple Grand and Jenny McCarthy and Donna Gates and all these people have so much to share. And so I wanted to be able to really share all that I've learned and not necessarily just fit a program to a child. Right. But I'll tell you how I got to the Sunrise program, which is um, when I was, uh, it's almost been 20 years. I can't believe it. it's almost been 20 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, how am I old enough that I've been anything for that right. long? Right, I, I know. Happens. There you go. <laughs> yeah. um, but really, this October, 1997, 96, 97, um, was the first time I ever met a child with autism. Mm. And I was uh, in college. I was a sociology major. I was in New York City. I was fighting the good fight of mm -hmm. social disparity. And um, my professor had made an announcement that a family with autism, with a child with autism, had one of his students that was working with him. She was graduating and they were looking for someone to replace her. Mm -hmm. So I thought, hmm, that sounds interesting. And I went to see the flyer and I called the number. And I had what I described one of those like flash moments when I got to the house and I knocked on the door and the mom answered the door. I can, I can, I can experience it almost like it just happened yesterday. Yeah. I had this flash where I just knew that from that point on, my life has gone down a very different path. Mm -hmm. I, I knew something very significant had happened in that moment mm -hmm. and, uh, and it did. Mm -hmm. So from that moment on, I began working with this family, this little boy named Jeffrey, mm -hmm. who was four years old at the time. And um, I would train in several days a week to work with him. 
and the most incredible unfolding happened. You know, this was a kid who was inconsolable in his tantrums and totally erratic in his sleeping and repetitive in his communication. And, and, and you know, he'd draw the same pictures over and over again. And the mom, I had no experience working mm -hmm. with someone with autism. She taught me everything she knew. She was trained in the Sunrise program. And the most incredible blossoming took place and I saw this child begin to calm down and open up and connect and um, play games and have social interests and have these yeah. we had used to have the most heartfelt deep conversations that I've had with almost anyone at the time with this you know young boy about mm -hmm. God and about life and this was something where he was just totally inaccessible when I first met him yeah. so that journey for me I mean of course I was astounded by the changes that I'd seen but I was even more so if not more so, really moved and touched by the way that we had worked with him. The approach mm -hmm. that was, as you were describing, you know, so honoring, so wanting him to fully flourish in who he was versus mm -hmm. trying to like get him to be something different, getting him to be, you know, what we want him to be. Right. And so it was full of such respect and such acceptance that, um, I was very grateful that I felt that at that point I had found my path of service. This is what I meant to do. This mm -hmm. is the people I meant to serve. And I've been doing that ever since. You know, I went to the Autism Treatment Center of America and I spent four years getting trained there. Mm -hmm. And now I've been working with families around the world. And I wrote the book Play to Grow mm -hmm. as a way for parents who often find themselves like, how do I do this? You know, what do I, what games, what activities can I do that will yeah. help engage my child in a way that's fun for us? It's not about chores and not about challenges, even though each game has a very specific target in mind, but in a way that ultimately builds a positive relationship and a positive interaction. Um, so I've just been doing that ever since, but I really attribute it all to Jeffrey, you know, the first little boy I ever yeah. worked with who showed me this important work. And, um, and it's been a real honor for me to serve the autism community, to work with the kids directly, which is how I started, and then ultimately to really work with the parents and to mm -hmm. give the parents uh, the tools to know how to reach their child. You know, that is, um, that is so, so important. And one of the reasons we're doing this summit is really to um, shift parents thinking from, I really need to fix this kid. I really need to make this kid normal to like relaxing and understanding that, um, you know, there's possibilities for connecting, um, you know, and the way you go about it is so important. And, um, and that may be um, the child emerging into um, uh, whatever the child is, is, is meant to be, um, will be totally different than what we expect. But, but what a great, amazing thing, because we're thinking about, um, you know, we're thinking about, um, they have to fit into this mold, but, and we're not even comprehending right. really the right you know the possibilities so um so bravo i'm so glad um yeah i'm so glad there's people like you doing this doing this work thank so you i mean tell me yeah. yeah tell me more about um what you do with parents and um you know just tell me more about what your experience have been so other parents can understand that there so is I, um, yeah. well, so anyone who doesn't know so i i live in israel i'm in israel right now and mm -hmm. um and initially, I came to Israel and was devoted to bringing this approach to families in Israel who didn't have it on a professional level. Mm -hmm. And then a mom from America contacted me and said, you know, I'd really love to work with you. And I was thinking, I don't know how that could happen because I'm traveling to people's homes. I'm going to northern Israel and southern Israel and going to their homes and working with the child and observing the parents. And um, we were trying to think how we could work together. And I said, you know, let's just try something. It's going to sound crazy, but why don't you just send me some videos on YouTube of this, that, and the other, and then I'll see what I can gather from the videos. And then we'll have some Skype consultations and we'll create goals and strategies together. And let's just, mm -hmm. let's try it and see how it goes. Awesome. Mm -hmm. total, total experiment. And it was amazing. I mean, I was skeptical that an intimate relationship could be formed through the screen like we are right now. But I yeah. have been really amazed at the really the depth of the relationship that I'm able to create with parents. Mm -hmm. um, the ability I'm able to really assess a child. So I do private coaching online with families all over the mm -hmm. world, from Sri Lanka, from Norway, from Austria, you know, families in Israel, families in the States. And they'll send me video footage and I'll write up a whole goal report and they'll be like, wow, how did you? How did you get my kid? You know, in, in those 40 minutes of video, I've had therapists working for years who 
didn't pick up on certain nuances. You know, it really has yeah. allowed me to rewind and pause and fast forward and really analyze a child and then have consultations where we really create very clear goals and strategies. So currently my work is entirely online, which mm -hmm. is for me, the internet has been a huge gift in that way. Because I am in Israel, it, I'm, I, it, there's no boundaries. You know, I can work with families anywhere in the world as long as you speak English or Hebrew or have a translator that can translate into English yeah. or Hebrew, yeah. you know, then sure. we can work together. And I think also what's additionally beneficial about it is I used to, you know, go travel to work with families and parents would really want me to see their kid having a tantrum so they can get input on that or their, their kid sure. trying to communicate but struggling and get input on that. But as we all know, we cannot predict what kids are going to do. And they might be sick or they might, I might show up and they didn't sleep all the night before. Or I might show up and they're just not doing the thing the parents wanted them to do. And then I didn't right. get to give them input on that. So the great thing about video is parents have total control. They can send me exactly the bits they want me to see. So I give them guidance yeah. on exactly those bits. And I was just, I'm amazed at how more effective it has been working that way. Um, it's also very convenient for me because having three kids myself, it allows me to not have to spend a lot of my time traveling and still really sure. serve the clients I want to work with. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Uh, so and I do a combination of private coaching and also online programs at different times. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, uh, and that's how I work with families. And so um, tell me, um, tell me what you think, um, you know, if, if you, if you had to sum up for parents, like some of the most important things, um, that you try to instill in them, what would that be? Like what, what sorts of things, um, you know, or maybe give us a scenario of, you know, um, explaining to parents what the tantrums mean or how would you, like, how would you engage them and, and help them? Okay. It's a bit of a broad question, so do you mind? Yeah, I, I know, I know, but it's, <laughs> I'm so interested in your in your approach. You know, I want other people to like understand okay. that there's, so you let, know. Let me get specific then from a different angle, like from okay. the back, the back there. Okay, <laughs> so like, I could talk about anything, you know, communication, know. tantrum, food. Um, so what I would love to do because this is something I, I prepared just before we sat down, and I this is a, uh, um, I have a YouTube channel, and this is mm -hmm. a video that I did that I got a lot of like really positive responses and mm -hmm. popular videos. And so it helps me know that I really like hit on something, yes. hit on something that is meaningful for parents that they want to know about, that they want to learn about, and they feel really resonates with them. And yet it's something that's really not talked about. So I'd like to share sort of what yes. I teach through that format, which is really all about self-esteem. You, know, mm -hmm. you and I were chatting just a little before we started this call about mm -hmm how oftentimes parents and professionals with the best intentions in the world look at a kid and have like a checklist in their mind of skills that need to be acquired and medical issues that need to be addressed. And I am not saying that skills and medical issues are not important. They right. of course are very important, but they often are exclusive to take the place of focusing on this person. Mm -hmm. This child who in the process of this journey is developing a sense of self mm -hmm. and what I think is primary and often not talked about is how to help a child develop a positive sense of self, especially a child with autism who is often misunderstood, who is often not seen mm -hmm. for their abilities, for their gifts. Yeah. Um, oftentimes people will talk about them in front of them. That's the extent to which they're not seen. Right. And so... I want to really talk about that because there are people and here are children who have gifts to give to the world and not only by addressing their self-esteem will they have just a more positive sense of self mm -hmm. and have a more empowered experience in their life but the more that any person or child can feel good about who they are mm -hmm. the more motivated and willing they're going to be to learn all those skills you want to teach them to begin with Exactly. Right? The more they see themselves as empowered and qualified and capable, the more they're going to come to a lesson and say, all right, I can do this. Give it to me. You know, show me what you got kind of thing. You know, Tally, that's so important. Um, in the books that I've read, especially, um, you know, the nonverbal autistic individuals, like I just right. read Edo in Autism Land. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh, this boy was completely intellectually intact and quite right. brilliant but he couldn't get his body, he couldn't speak, he couldn't get his body to do what he needed to do. People would talk in front of him. He was 
he was so, so injured emotionally um, because nobody believed in him. So huge. That's exactly important. it. They, they get everything. The nonverbal children, whether you think, you know, nothing's going on, they're watching and observing and getting everything. So hugely important. So yeah. yes. Yes. And I think that's, that's the most critical segment. The most yeah. critical segment are these children and people with autism who mm -hmm. are incredibly intelligent and incredibly curious yes. and are not able to express that. And so they're often the most misunderstood, the most overlooked, the most mm -hmm. made invisible. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a little easier for someone who has verbal skills to be able to show their intelligence. But mm -hmm. even for those children, too, it's, mm -hmm. they're often way undermined. And so... That's, that's something I really want to talk about. And I have like several points that I think people can really, because I, theory is interesting, but I'm really all about, and this is in my teaching too, like giving you things you can implement and action steps. Because you could read theory forever, but right. we want to help these kids. We yes. want to help these parents. So like, yes. let me give you things to do. So I have. That's, what, that's what we want. That's what parents yes. want. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to get into it here. And then each point I think really addresses that particular issue, but also um, gives you insight into my overall teaching philosophy. Mm -hmm. perspective. Okay. So the first point, this is what I consider to be the, some of the critical strategies in helping your child develop self-esteem. And the first one is really about perspective, which is about changing your goal, mm -hmm. completely changing your question. So oftentimes parents will look at a child and think, how can I close the gap? between him and his peers? How can I make him more socially appropriate? How can I make him look like, interact with, and perceive the world like we do? Mm -hmm. How can we eliminate those differences? Mm -hmm. And I think that question in and of itself gets in the way of your child developing a positive sense of self because whether you realize it or not, it drives everything you do and it is communicated in everything you do. And so a child's experience is constantly this experience of trying not recognizing that everyone wants to, them to be like somebody else. Mm -hmm. Sure. Like there's nothing more disempowering than that. Yes. Um, so what I really want to start with is changing the question to be, how can I help this child more fully bring his unique self to the world around him? Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Right. It's so like what you were saying before, how this child might emerge might look totally different than what you had in mind. And it's yes. about, and I'm not saying this is an easy test, this is a big let go for parents, yes. but it's the most like liberating thing you can do and is what truly allows your child to flourish, which is coming to your child from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Who are you and how can I help you, your very special soul with your very special gifts, be expressed more fully because the world needs you. Yes. Not you yes. to be like him or you to be like her or you to be like anything else. Um, and that in and of itself completely, all the strategies that you do will shift mm. when you come from that perspective. So that's the first thing. And it uh -huh. really asks you to look at your child with a fresh set of eyes, you sure. know, with an open set of eyes, with a desire to really know who this person is and mm. support them. And what I call sort of giving birth to themselves mm -hmm. versus trying to make them something they're not. Yes. Excellent. Uh -huh. um, so that's the first thing. That's mm -hmm. the first strategy. And I think if you just walk away with that, that's a huge, big, big that's a big paradigm shift. And I think yeah. even just feeling differently about that, yeah. your child will sense that and respond. Yeah. I can it. imagine it's, it's, you know, it's, it's almost like, you know, a label, like I just um, discovered that my own son, um, you know, the school processed, a, you know, an IQ test because they do it at, you know, certain intervals. And he scored in the 99.9th percentile for visual spatial. And it, I just went, holy cow. And I found a new label, twice exceptional, which is a totally different way to look at them than autistic, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it is, it's your perception. So that's a, a beautiful first step. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that will really um, influence everything else. Yeah. Um, and then the second piece, and this is all, they're all kind of related and build upon each other, but mm -hmm. is really identifying and developing your child's strengths. Mm -hmm. Right. So everyone has their own unique strengths. And oftentimes you're focusing on the challenges and the skills that yes. they're missing and all the gaps. Yes. And not focusing on the strengths. So I'm thinking about for my own son, for example, who has a lot of challenges with reading, mm -hmm. um, learning, uh, attention. So he spends hours a day at school. Mm -hmm. 
faced, you know, directly being faced with what is most challenging for Mm -hmm. him. And that isn't something that will necessarily build a lot of self-confidence because you're constantly having this experience of like, this is hard for me. I'm not doing it as easy as everybody else is. So for him and for all kids, it's especially important to identify what is this kid good at? Mm -hmm. What is where does he shine? You know, where does he really feel like this is, this is my thing and making Mm -hmm. sure you carve out time for that, you know? So for my son is involved in carpentry workshops and nature workshops where he gets Mm -hmm. to like get in there and do what he knows to do. And is so good at doing, which is working with his hands. Mm -hmm. And then he has pockets where he can see that might be challenging for me, but this I rock, you know, and he can then identify and build a sense of self around that. Beautiful. Yeah. So I think it's really important to really recognize in the first piece is really wanting even to know what is my kid really good at? You know, is it comics? Is it music? Is it dance? You know, or even not even good at, but really enjoys. Right. 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 And then really developing that particular strength. Yeah. Sure. um, Is really, really very important. And, um, you know, I think sometimes those are not prioritized because if they're not very specifically skill-based or don't, reach a certain goal Mm -hmm. and they're not prioritized. But my message is that that is more important than anything else, because without that positive sense of self, your child will be a listless learner, you know, just won't have the inspiration he needs to learn things that are challenging for him. Yeah. Makes sense. Sure. Um, And then with that, and I think this is an important one too, is if possible, finding a group that has that strength as the focus, Mm -hmm. right? So for example, if your child really likes to paint and then they're part of a painting group, Mm -hmm. really likes to, um, you know, play music and is part of a music group, what then happens is not only are they developing their strength, not only are they developing the area where they shine, but then comes a sense of belonging that goes along with that because I'm now a part of something Mm -hmm. based on what I love. Yeah. I'm a part of something based on what I'm good at. And that just fills a person up. Yeah. Um, so besides identifying the strength, you can then also take it a step further by really making basically a community, mm-hmm. you know, out of whatever that strength is. Great. Great. Um, and then the next two kind of go together. Um, and they're in the category more of helping your child really be independent and make contributions. So I think we could all think of places where we might hover, where we might do more for our child than we need to, uh-huh. right? Constantly. Um, constantly, <laughs> right? And um, because we want their clothes to be on right and their things in their hair, all those yes. things that moms want. Um, yet it's disempowering to come just swoop in and to do things for our children mm-hmm. all the time and to really allow them to do it their way, even though it might be a little bit messier, even mm-hmm. though it might not come out just the way you want it. Yeah. But, and I could just think of my own son when he was young and he would dress himself and his shirt would be backwards and inside out with like yes. the buttons in the back, you know, but he was so proud. Yeah. That he you know, that. my, um, my youngest son who is seven, um, he has insisted his entire life that he does everything for himself. Like you uh-huh. couldn't put his shoes on him uh-huh. and tie his shoes. You couldn't help him brush his teeth. No, he wants to do it himself. Good so it's beautiful, beautiful lesson. Yeah. And I, I do, I swoop in um, and, and try to do things for my son with autism all the time. So I'm going to take that point to heart. I don't, think sure. I don't think there's any parent that hasn't said to me like, oh my God, I, to- I totally do that. Like all just the other day, my older son, we were baking something and he was mixing it. And then he gives it to me and then I, I give it like another mix or two, you know, and he, and he said to me, he's like, I hate it when you do that. Oh, you know, and I was like, what? I didn't realize it at first. I was like, what? He's like, you know, I was supposed to mix it and then you take it and you mix it. Yeah. I basically realized in that moment, I diminished yeah. what, he every, did. what he did, his contribution. And I was like, you know what? You are so right. Thank oh. you for pointing that out to me. Like as much as I want to like mix that lump, that, lump, that lump. <laughs> that lump out you know I have to leave like, the lump back. <laughs> his sense of self is more important than the lump yeah you know? that's something I have to keep on coming back to so I think that independence is a really important thing um to prioritize and to make space for it's really just about making space it's about mm-hmm. taking a step back and making space for that child to have the pride from I did that myself I yeah. made that sandwich you know I tied my shoe I pulled up my pants myself whatever it is um and then to take that one step further would be finding a way that your child can actually make a contribution. 
So beyond something where I'm taking care of myself, uh-huh. it's a sense of doing something for others. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, I'm sure you can relate to that and everyone can relate to that sense of, of worthiness and meaning that comes from being able to support or be of service to others. And mm-hmm. it could be in really small ways, whether it's like, you know, watching your brother and sister or taking out the trash or whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. that, that piece is, but contributing to something other than himself mm-hmm. is a wonderful way for someone to really develop a positive sense of self. You know, we have, um, I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, I would love to, to broaden this. Um, but with my own son who is 12, um, his job is to feed the dog morning mm-hmm. and night. And if, you know, we, we want him to understand that if you don't feed the dog, she's going to be hungry. And, you know, so something small like that. Um, totally. But yeah, I could see, um, I could see finding what they're passionate about or what they really love doing and tying that into being with the group, maybe contributing at the group, you know, there's yep. probably a lot of, a lot of, um, clever ways we could, um, we could fashion that for our kids. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important with this. You can't like fool them. Meaning yeah. it has to be sincere. It's like, Oh, thank yeah. you so much for doing that. That was so helpful. And then as soon as they leave you, like, you know, reorganize everything or right. line things up, like really allow them to contribute. You know, mm-hmm. to make, to let them do whatever piece you set out to do that for them to do and then mm-hmm. leave it, you know, let that contribution stand as their contribution. Even as we're talking mm-hmm. right now, my 10 year old son, we just got three chickens in a little chicken coop mm-hmm. and he like, he's totally taking charge of that. So he's out there, he's cleaning out the chicken things, he's eating them and he's dumping it in the compost. And I see him out there and he's sweating, you know, he's got his gloves on and he is just in his element. He, the pride that comes from. I'm in charge. I got this. Yeah. He, you know, you can feel it. And yeah. I think as soon as you as a parent step back and allow for that opportunity and then see in your child that beam mm-hmm. of you trust me, I'm capable. You see that I'm capable. Suddenly this mm-hmm. person who maybe was more invisible before starts mm-hmm. to be seen. Yeah. And it's a beautiful thing to see your child experience being seen in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that definitely. will give you the fuel to continue to create opportunities like that. Sure. sure. Beautiful. Um, and I don't want to see what, if there's anything else I wanted to add here. Oh, this is a big one. Okay, this is a big one. This is, if there's anything I can scream from the rooftops, this is what I'd say I'd always <laughs> scream, <laughs> which is to, to speak to your child's true intelligence. And this goes back to what you were saying before especially for children who are nonverbal, preverbal, limited in their verbal skills. It is yes. so important to know that they, their, their challenge in communicating verbally means absolutely nothing about their comprehension. Yes. And so true. if we speak to them mm-hmm. based on their ability to communicate, thinking that's the extent to which they understand, then we are completely missing their true intelligence. And I don't know, I'm sure you've had the experience. I know I've had the experience when someone talks down to you, you know, like Mm -hmm. you don't understand, like, don't worry your pretty little mind about whatever it is that's going on. Right. Again, it's the very opposite of helping you build a positive sense of self. And so it's dropping the baby talk. It's not talking about your kid in front of your kid. It's about completely straight talk. I can't say enough about straight talk. And it's how I talk to my own kids too. So for example, it's even like, listen, we're trying this new treatment and here's why we're trying it. We're trying it because there's something in your stomach that, 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 and we believe that if we added this, that could help take care of that. And that would help you feel more comfortable. So -hmm. we're going to try, get them on board with what's happening versus just slipping something in their smoothie. (laughs) <laughs> they're not a partner in what's going on. You know what I mean? Guilty of that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm sure. And of course, there's always exceptions, but talk directly to your kid. Communicate. Yeah. You know, like when you did something that you like, that wasn't the most helpful thing, but you know what? I am sorry. I totally screwed that up. I should not have stepped yeah. in there. You totally had that. I apologize. You know, like talk like you would talk to any other person. And your child will stand taller for it. No yeah. question about it. It's a really good point. Cause I know I, um, I'm notorious for just, you know, I'm trying this, I'm trying that over the years and just, you know, literally throwing things in there and, and expecting him to just do it. Um, 
you know, I wonder if you can give us some examples, Tally, in, in yeah. your work with kids. Like, you know. I was just going to do that. Oh, good. Okay, go for it. Yeah, I've had, a, <laughs> I've had a two examples right now, and I'm glad you asked yeah. that. Um, it is a perfect example of how talking straight to your kid not mm -hmm. only will help develop a positive sense of self, but helps them become more cooperative in what you're trying to do together versus you mm -hmm. trying to get them to do this agenda you have that they might not have any idea about. Mm -hmm. So there was one family I was working with from Australia and her daughter would um, roll up pieces of paper into little balls and chew them and swallow them. Mm. It was really challenging for the mom. She sure. was really concerned that she was going to get sick and she would gag and she would throw up and it was this, this really challenging yeah. behavior. So I talked to the mom about it and I said, talk to her about it. Like when she's, you know, when you're in bed with her, when she's like the most available, the most attentive, mm -hmm. get into it with her. Talk about what happens when those balls end up in her stomach. Talk yeah. about what kind of damage that could do to her digestive system. Talk about what kind of damage the throwing up can do. You know, talk about how other people might respond when they see her doing that. Talk about all the reasons mm -hmm. why you want her to do, not do that because it'll mm -hmm. be helpful to her and talk to her about what other things she can do instead that might satisfy that saying me, like talk to her about why you want her to stop doing that. Like, Great point. Don't really get into it. I'm telling you, the daughter, Amelia, this little girl, stopped doing it. I believe she, and, and it. She, and she saw her in several moments, like almost start to, but then almost uh -huh. like recall the conversation mm -hmm. and then stop. Yeah. My, it seems so simple, but yet it's almost never done. You know, I do that with my other two kids naturally, but I right. don't think to do it with my son with autism because, you know, it, and my son speaks. Um, so you wouldn't think I'd be so blocked, but yeah, I don't, I don't. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, I want to say it's terrible. It's just, it's, I'm glad you're bringing this up because it's just something we do that we don't even realize we're doing or right. not doing, you know? Totally. Totally. And it, and it's, it takes a leap of faith. It takes looking at this kid and believing because I just believe mm -hmm. that you understand more than you communicate. And so yeah. I'm going to talk to that yeah. and, and realize that it's, it's actually disconnected from your verbal communication skills. And then once you do that and you see how your child responds, then it just becomes evidence for you that that's the case. Yeah, sure. Right. And I'll give you one more example. The same thing happened with a little girl who had Rett syndrome and um, they wanted to give her supplements, but she was totally refusing, completely refusing the supplements that were supposed to really help support her immune system. And same thing. I was like, tell her, tell her what's going on in her body. Tell her where she's deficient. Tell her how not being a deficient in those areas are going to help her with the things that are important to her. Yeah. You know, like make it meaningful for her and tell her why you're giving her that spoonful of stuff that she might not like to drink. Yeah. Same thing. Even though she looked like she wasn't listening, you yeah. know, she was running around doing her thing. looks like she's not listening. She began to take her supplements without a fight for the first time. Awesome. Right. Yeah. So, and I don't mean to present it as this is the way to get things done. This is like a, you know, another strategy to get your kid to, to be compliant. That's right. the, that's additional benefit to it. Right. Really I'm coming at it from because your child deserves it. Yeah. And because he will again have the experience of being seen right when you speak to their true intelligence but the additional benefit is this compliance this partnership this yeah. we're together because you're including me on yeah. in what's happening and talking to me and explaining things to me yeah yeah i could i could totally understand um you know i could i'm just thinking of a scenario <clears throat> i remember years ago um seeing a child that i think he was eight years old and he was still wearing diapers and he did the, the poo smearing and, um, you know, one of, uh, one of my mentors, Sydney Baker looked at the mom and this was just really, I don't, it, it's so simple, but so profound looked at the mom and said, you need to explain to your child that it's not okay to do that. Why it's not okay to do that. Um, but also to try to figure out why they're doing it. So, so it's, it's not just about, okay, you have to stop doing that, but trying right. to understand, you know, opening yourself up to, um, trying to understand why they're doing it, you know, so really, yeah. really, really important. Yeah. Um, what, um, what, what would you recommend for parents um, mm -hmm. when they're, when they're trying to figure out what their child is good at, like what their strengths are? Um, do parents ask you that? Yeah. Like, they how do. do I figure out? How do I figure that out? Sometimes it can be obvious because right. it's obvious, but a lot of kids, 
it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell what their interests are because they may be, you know, carrying something around with them all day and just flitting around the room. So what do right. you, how do you, how do you help them with that? That's a really, really good question. I would say two ways. Okay. One is just really astute observation. Yeah. Taking a step back and say, I'm just going to watch. Mm-hmm. With with this investigative mind of, I want to mm-hmm. know what mm-hmm. my child gravitates towards mm-hmm. and observing in, in a way that you're dropping all preconceptions of what that might look like. So it doesn't mm-hmm. mean that my child's going to sit down and then just draw comics for two hours. Obviously, then that's their, that's where that child gravitates towards. Right. But with some kids, it's more subtle than that. With mm-hmm. some kids, it's just sensory exploration. Mm-hmm. Right. With some kids, it's physical play. Mm-hmm. You know, it, with some kids, it's something that maybe you don't identify as what he gravitates towards, what mm-hmm. he delights in, where mm-hmm. he really uh, shines. So I mm-hmm. think the first piece is just to really make an intention to observe in that way. Maybe mm-hmm. even log the kind of things that you're noticing. Talk about it with other people in your child's life, whether it be mm-hmm. teachers or your, you know another parent. What do they notice? What do they observe? Mm-hmm. Sometimes a fresh set of eyes also helps you when you're like in the front, on the front lines every day, it's a little hard to take that step back. Sure. Um, so you can also ask other people. But my first point would be to really observe with that intention in mind. Mm-hmm. And the second thing would be to give your child exposure to a larger repertoire of things. So oftentimes, you know, a kid might kind of commit themselves to certain interests. And so that's just what people keep giving them. You know, yeah. all right, you know, you like these kind of figurines, I'll just keep giving you more of those. You like uh, shapes, we'll just keep doing shape stuff. Yeah. And then forget to say that, well, but unless I expose you to something else, we might not ever find out yeah. that you also like music and you like colors and, you know, whatever it is. Yes. So I'd say those two things together, observing what your child's already doing mm-hmm. and then exposing your child to new things with the, with the intention being to see simply how they respond to it. You know, that's, um, that is a really good point. And I think that, you know, moms have moms and dads, they have that innate intuition of, of, um, you know, like, for example, for my son, I was like, you know, I would, I would put puzzles, I would do sphere puzzles or origami and, and polyhedrons and like just stuff. And I, I, I'd find things that, you know, all different kinds of brain teaser puzzles and whatnot. And I would just naturally buy these things thinking he would like them. And, and most of the time he would, he would enjoy these new things. And so I think that's really important um, Mm. because, you know, a lot of our kids do perseverate. um, But what I noticed is um, with my own son, he does perseverate on things, but then the more new things are introduced, he leaves that and goes on to something else. So huge, huge, um, uh, thing, you know, for parents to do. I think that's really important. And again, that intuition, like, I think they might like this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah I that, think it's great. It's fun. Yeah. And, fun. and I think it's also, you need to be a little patient with it. So sometimes yeah. a kid needs to be exposed to something several times, you know, mm-hmm. they might just sort of recognize it from the periphery at first and then sort of look at it more directly the next time around and then be willing to like kind of touch it or smell it. Mm-hmm. You know, give your child time to really become acquainted with something before you just discount it because it could be that if he was exposed to or she was exposed to, you know, that particular puzzle or, the, or those balls just a little bit longer, mm-hmm. he would have become much more comfortable and curious yeah. about them. So I think it's both giving exposure and also um, giving repeated exposure, you know, sure. before you just say, nah, that's not for him kind of thing. Yeah, good, good. Oh, um, and I have a last little cluster of things that I want to share. Sure, beautiful. So, Bring okay, it on. And the last little <laughs> cluster, okay. Um, the last little cluster is about ways that we could simply um, offer a supportive experience to mm-hmm. our children. All right, mm-hmm. so we're talking about developing their strengths, developing their interests, um, you know, speaking to their true abilities and and becoming part of a group in that way and contributions and independence are all really important areas. Mm -hmm. Um, And we want to ultimately help each child to have a positive experience in their lives. Mm -hmm. And part of that is then also seeing where the challenges are and doing our best to cushion, soften, eliminate, Mm -hmm. you know, unload the burden as Mm -hmm. much as we can so that they can be freed up to enjoy the things they truly enjoy. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that Mm -hmm. is sort of in two ways. It's, it's creating an environment of supportive people Mm 
-hmm. and also creating a supportive environment. So the first one in terms of supportive people is I'm sure everyone can think of people in your child's life mm -hmm. who judge them, where someone comes in and judges your child, doesn't accept your child, thinks he's just being naughty or bratty or obnoxious, mm -hmm. or, you know, we all have yeah. that. To really do an assessment of the people in your child's life mm -hmm. and recognize, is there anyone here that's toxic to my child? Mm -hmm. Is there anyone here that is undermining to my child? Is there anyone here that conveys either, you know, explicitly or non-explicitly um, that my child isn't good enough? Yeah. And really consider who are the people in your life? Who are the people that you can eliminate? Mm -hmm. or diminish the exposure to so that your child is surrounded by people mm -hmm. who see them the way we're talking about today. Yeah. Yeah. That is huge. And as we get older and we have more control in our lives, we self-select to be around people who we know love us for who we are, mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, and to the best of our ability, support who we are, believe in our abilities. And so we want to do the same thing for our child. If they can't do that naturally for themselves is to cultivate a kind of supportive group of people around them. You know, I think that that is um, especially important. Um, I just was reading, someone was asking for help with their child, um, really, really hating going to school, like just, mm. you know, and, and the first thing that came to mind was, well, who is that child exposed to that might be, you know, undermining um, their self-worth right. or, you know, so I think parents just have to advocate. People think, oh, it's hard right. at school. You go in there and you find out who's who, what's going on, what the people are like, and you, you, you demand changes if, you know, if you have a child has a one-on-one -on -one or, you know, it, it's not, it's not beyond the parent to go in there, um, you know, and make changes like that. So I think that's really, really yeah. important. Yeah. And it might be someone who's not at a school setting, but yeah. in your family, you know, yeah. or a friend, something where it's just a more intimate relationship that, mm -hmm. you know, you have control and you have power to different extents in different situations. But I think mm -hmm. as soon as you make it a priority to surround your, yourself, yourself, mm -hmm. your family and your child by people who support and believe in your child's abilities and in your ability to parent that child, then that's just going to create a more positive quality of life. Absolutely. For everybody. Right. And, and I think it's, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Now, just the last piece is, you know, oftentimes it's talked about the, the sensory issues that people with autism have and the dysregulation that goes along with that. So that mm -hmm. everyday life can feel like, you know, this battle of just maintaining sanity when everything comes, comes in so strong. Yes. And so when you have an experience of drowning in sensory overload mm -hmm. or constantly having to battle that, that also doesn't necessarily give an experience of, I can do this. I can feel good about myself. I'm capable. Sure. And so creating a supportive environment, a room, a space, a special space where your child can go and just like totally relax Yeah. and take a break from that, you know, and they have all their little sensory stuff that they might need that helps them to do that toys to play with music, to listen to whatever it is, mm -hmm. a haven mm -hmm. where a child can feel safe and feel comfortable and download so that they have a place where they're not constantly holding the tension of managing their sensory input. Um, it's also a very supportive thing you can do just to help them feel better, feel stronger, feel more mm -hmm. capable and empowered, which is all part of this bigger picture of helping them have a positive sense of self. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great advice. Great advice. Yeah. So that's, that's, you know, little pieces of all different kind of aspects of what I think is important. And it all comes down to um, seeing each person as a person mm -hmm. and wanting to help their strengths and their delights shine forward and helping to like try to eliminate as much as we can the barriers that help them from doing that. Yeah. So, so, so beautiful. Um, I am so grateful that you shared all of these um, ah, perfect, perfect action items for parents mm. um, to see their child differently. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, part of, you know, part of the struggle that we have is maybe not giving ourselves permission to mm. see them as capable, right? But it's, right. it's almost like, you know, we don't think they're capable because they're not able to, you know, have conversations like we have. Um, 
but that's just so not true. So thank you so much um, for shedding all this beautiful light and giving mm. parents something um, really tangible and helpful um, to help their children. Thank you, Tally. My, my pleasure. And just the one thing I want to say for anyone who is listening, you know, we talked about a lot of different things and there's a lot uh, with each point, there's so much more we could talk about. But I think oftentimes parents get really overwhelmed. There's so many different points and strategies and goals and blah, 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 that yeah. you end up being paralyzed and you can't remember anything and can't put one foot in front of the other because you're just so bombarded with everything. So mm -hmm. I just want to make a suggestion if you're listening today to take a moment and just reflect on all the different things that you and I spoke about mm -hmm. and pick one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, identify and crystallize for yourself what resonated with you, what really mm -hmm. spoke to you. Some things just kind of fly off and the things that you need to hear right now in this moment kind of right. just hit, you know, and mm -hmm. to really take a moment to acknowledge that, to recognize that, to identify what it is so that you can lead with that clearly and see the ways that it impacts your interactions with your child and the way that your child interacts with you. That's terrific. That's great advice. And Tally, where can people find you? I know parents are going to want to know where to find you. Give us your, um, your information if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a free gift that we're going to be offering. Yes. Right. Okay. So I'm sure you'll, the link will be clear, but there's a, yes. uh, I'm getting to the six steps to boost your child's social skills that you can download, which I really recommend for any parent who wants to help their child um, develop social skills further with, you know, both interaction between parent and child and with peers mm -hmm. to um, sign up for that. And then once you sign up for that, you also become part of my global autism community, get my weekly video blogs and what I call my nuggets of inspiration, little like right. inspiration bits along the way. Right. Um, you can also go to my website, which is www.tollyberman.com. Mm -hmm. um, I have a channel on YouTube where you can also listen to all my videos, Tali Berman Autism Specialist, um, and my Facebook page too. You can get to all that from my website. So you get to my okay. website and then click on the different links and sign up for the different things and you're hooked in. <laughs> great, great, great. Yeah. Um, thanks again, Tally. Um, I know this is going to be hugely successful and um, helpful to so many people. Thank you for everything you're doing. My pleasure. And thank you for putting together such an exciting and important summit. It's such a beautiful gathering of people to really help parents feel supported and have the knowledge they need to help their children. So thank you for all your efforts. Oh, my pleasure. All right. Take care. Take care.